we don't have to actually move. Nee, oh ja, the, ik wil meteen. Uh, yeah. Now I it's completely like. Go to the mic. Relax. Uh, let me put the sound up. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hello, white people. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to say <it>. hi, <laughs> uh, my name is Olava Basabosa. Uh, you're listening and watching Olava Talks. Um, let me just first introduce what Olava Talks is. Uh, Olava Talks is a, a sort of improvised, uh, well, actually, it's more like a podcast in development. Um, in the last three or four years, I have had uh, I've had the privilege and the honor to meet and work with incredibly inspiring and inspired thinkers, activists, doers, uh, mostly who were women of color and queer. And um, I found myself oftentimes having these amazing conversations that from which I grew so much and which I learned so much. And every time leaving, going home and thinking, I have no record of this moment. I have no archive of the brilliance and 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 of these people and of these engagements in this context. And so I started thinking a lot about how conversations um, can be such a great tool for generating, creating knowledge, but also transmitting knowledge. And um, I, had, I had the silly idea that one day I would love to do a podcast um, where I could sort of uh, archive this and record, rec record how this happens. Um, I think within a year or so, there was a Dip South podcast <laughs> that showed up on my sort of radar. And I literally was listening to women, women of color, black women, having these conversations that I've been having with people <laughs> on air and just putting it out there. You're one of those women, but we'll get back to that later. <laughs> uh, just trying to explain how honored I am that this person is here with us right now. <laughs> so, um, I'm also a writer and I'm a politician and uh, I organize with LGBT youth, um, queer people. And, um, and so I've always, I've really been struggling these last couple of years to find a way to bring a record of that. The Hague Peace Project and the Freedom Books Fair heard about this idea and they were immediately like, we're on board, how can we help you? You know, what do you need? I said, I need some voice sound equipment. And um, that's all I thought we were gonna do, but then it has turned into a live show, right? So it's quite exciting. I'm a little bit nervous still. <laughs> this is the third one in three days. Uh, the first one was with Rashida Aziz, author of um, Niemann Saw Here Slap If Not, No One Shall Sleep Here Tonight, amazing person. Uh, the second one was Helene Christel Mungayende, who is a co-author of the new book called Zwart, uh, Black, um, an amazing collection of, there are people coming in, an amazing collection of, of, of um, African, like so African writers who write in Dutch. And the last one of the installment for this time around is Anushan Zume, author of Hallo Vita Mensa. And I don't know, can we zoom in? Can, that's not how live stream works. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You can't. So, um, if you don't know this book, you probably shouldn't be watching this. I don't even know why you want this. We have nothing to discuss. <laughs> Hello, Vita Mensa uh, came out about a year ago. Uh, May 17, 2017. Yeah. May 2017. And this book is quite, um, I basically think of it as um, the first Dutch um, a, a attempt at helping white people develop racial literacy, right? Develop a sense and an idea of what's the language, what's the, what are the theories, just basic, and basic manual for white people on how to interact with their own race and that of others. And that makes it simply groundbreaking for the Dutch context, and I think possibly even for the European context, right? Um, I read it, loved it, and then, I, as I was reading it, I was thinking of you know, just putting it on my Instagram, sending it to my white friends and be like, you see, remember when I tried to explain this? Here's <laughs> ah, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, um, it is an important book. Um, I advise you to get one, get one for yourself, but also for your neighbors. Uh, get one for the teachers of your children. <laughs> um, Make it just make it just a just a, an, an, a gift. Just give it to people the next year as birthday gifts. They're great, especially for white people. And, but now, <laughs> and you can get a quartet. Now you also get a 
A game, a card game. Yeah, you get a card game. Could, 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 could you give us a card game? See, people need to understand how much they're getting for their money. <laughs> yeah. You need to see this. Just, we got, and there are many, there are cards. I feel like I'm teleshopping. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, this book is very, very important. And we're sitting here with Anushan Zume. And the thing about Anushan Zume, it's been really hard to sort of figure out what to talk to Anushan Zume about because Anusha has done so much. She has <laughs> such an incredibly rich background, uh, fa family-wise, uh, the thing, the places you've lived, the work you've done, the even just the current projects you're doing right now. And I hope we can talk a little bit about some of those, like Dip South podcast, really important to me. Dip South exclusive, um, the Halo Vita Mensa. Uh, but let's start with Halo Vita Mensa. Okay. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. For, <laughs> thank you for the incredible, sweet, and wow introduction yes yeah. it's worth it it's definitely worth it you're you're all of those things and more and i'm incredibly honored also because i think for me like um seeing other black women i'm getting a little bit emotional i don't know why. <laughs> seeing other black women um so unapologetically uh voicing uh, uh uh giving a voice to our current condition uh women black women who are aware of our past where we've been who have a sense of that and who, ha who honor that, uh, but also aspire to more for the future, seeing them in the Dutch context of African descent um, with complicated inter you know, sort of identities and being proud mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. and living that and working with other black women, uh, with other people of color to make that happen to me is so entirely inspirational. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know how else to sort of say like, that even the way that you come to do to do this thing with me, I'm completely trying out this podcasting thing. <laughs> like, and you say, sure, I'll do it with you. No problem. Of course, yeah. And you have a very busy life and you could just, I just love that. Oh. Anyways, let's talk about the book. <laughs> yes, thank you. Why did you write this book? Um, well, actually, uh, like what you said, uh, I also have had so many of these kind of frustrating conversations with white people um, usually about racism officially but then when you come home you realize this is not a talk about racism mm. this is a talk about whiteness this yeah. is about white supremacy this is about white privilege this is about white tears mm. this is about anything except racism so i thought it would be good to to turn the lens around so um because i spoke with my friends also my dipsas friends about making like a racism for dummies sort mm. of as a joke also but then I thought, you know, what we, the world doesn't really need a racism for dummies, but maybe we need a whiteness yeah. for dummies. Because for us, for people of color, it's, that's such a given. Mm. <laughs> that's how you're maybe even raised or your parents explain to you. Mm. You, you know, it's even, there's even words, code switching, yeah. where you switch literally from culture to code of culture at home, on the street, in school, or if you go to a professional setting that it's so ingrained in our lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And I realized a lot of white people are completely oblivious yeah. to that and even expect more. Yeah. So what we already do is not enough. So I thought it was interesting to, um, to study that and to turn the lens around and explain that to uh, white people, this is how it is yeah. for us. And also for, for people of color to yes. read it and to feel First of all, you're not, you're not, yes. there's nothing wrong with you. Yes. Everything you felt is true. Yeah. It's based also, it's, it's been researched. I give a lot of, um, because I'm not a, a scholar, but I give a lot of scholarly um, links and, and articles and a lot of researchers. There's a lot of research has gone into this book to point out what's already been written academically, mm. to give words also, simple words, my yeah. words, words of my friends, and also academic words to what we feel, yeah. to what we go through. Yeah. So in that sense, the book has hopefully a double audience, white people and people of color. I, it definitely did resonate with me. Like I read it and I found myself going back to certain uh, episodes. I, I was really struck by the impersonal accounts, you know, like your, your encounters, with, like your, your, the dynamics between you and your children, for yeah. example, <clears throat> with your mom and with like you being in high school, like in, 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 in school. And, and I could, I would go back to those pieces and be like, you know, just, I was always, I was so impressed by how you take from those personal experiences and you draw lessons and analysis out of that to, to draw from our personal experience and make sort of like actual theory and, sh and prove something to me has been always a problem because I've always felt like I needed to somehow come up with numbers and, yeah. and statistics and like, and not say, well, I went through this and it means this. And I thought that was really... So to me, that recognizing, uh, like, 
sort of that 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 process of like I recognize this just really touched me and I kept going back. But the formulation also, like you find a way of making it so simple actually, of really making the at some point you talk about sort of pit and you end with like, okay, but at this at this is the end of this chapter with a lot of explanation, she goes, but at the end of the day, <laughs> if you're still not convinced that what the Pete, uh, Black Pete is racist, you know, and you cannot see that 400 years of, of colonization of people of color, of black people, makes this figure very problematic, you know, then there's something wrong with you. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of humor in there. And, and, and one of the things that I noticed as well was how you speak with your friends in this book. Yeah. And I kept going like, wait a minute, this is somebody, I'm not used to having writers talk about the conversations they have with their friends and how they've come to knowledge to understand things with their friends. It tends to be like, I am this big shot person. Yeah, no. I get everything, this is what, but you really bring in your friends. Yeah, I thought it was really important to give people a voice because we don't have a lot of space where we can voice our opinions, our feelings. Uh, of course, I talked about it to my friends, and some names are not their real names, you know, to protect them, but to at least get their, the message from their perspective mm -hmm. out, because I think that's so important. Usually, when we talk about whatever is happening in society, it's been discussed from one perspective, which is male, mm -hmm. white, um, uh, of, of a certain education, of a certain sexual orientation, yep. of a certain gender. Yep. And that's always the perspective, so that makes everybody res has to react to that perspective. Yep. And it's so tiring, and it's so boring, and uh, yeah, I wanted to, like I said, turn the lens around and also offer different perspectives yep. of people who are um, uh, know about it. For, yep. Like, for instance, I was in Bonaire, and I also, one of the chapters is about neocolonialism from me being in Bonaire and looking around me and not like not believing what I see. But I thought it was also important to have a Bonarian uh, activist, you know, she's also a beautiful body activist, mm. but body positive. So it's, it's her piece also is in mm. there with her name because mm. I also want to show, and what, that's what we also do with Dips House, and uh, to show how much talent yeah. there is. How does that, because I feel like I'm always curious about women who, when they have led the way forward, when they create platforms for themselves, or, you know, the, the Dutch call it infechte, who fight their way in, um, those that actually go back and look for other women of color and black women or queer people to bring up with them. I'm always curious about about how does that go? What is that? Where do you get that? What is the, because you're doing the, the Dips House yeah. podcast and I have heard all these women of all walks of life come through the podcast yeah. and you give them so much space. You don't antagonize, you don't, you're not, like it is a very warm and, 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 and welcoming space for them. And I want to I wanna, I wanna hear, like, what is the, what's the strategy? Uh -huh. what's the <laughs> no, the, the strategy, I mean, we, 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 Mariam is here, my colleague from Dips House, oh. and uh, we spoke about it actually today that, yeah, the perspective, if you look at journalism, is very anti protagonist, antagonist. Well, that goes back to the Greek ages, mm. and who were discussing democracy, <laughs> men on the hill from the elite, you know, it was like 30 guys who decided this is the way it should be. <laughs> and even now in journalists, it's still the same. Like, no, we're going to talk. And uh, even if your opinion doesn't resonate with me, blah, 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 I can handle that. And that's a very luxury position. Mm. Because if you're in a position of power, it's really nice to have a big discussion at night at 11 o'clock. Mm. And then you go to your cushy job and your life because the whole society is, is made for your success. Yeah. So it's so nice to have like a big discussion, debate, and la that's it. It doesn't yeah. touch you. It doesn't touch your life. Your well-being, your job opportunities, how you're perceived in school, mm. doesn't matter. Yeah. For us, it matters. If one of us, if people of color are in a big discussion program, that resonates on their life, on their career maybe, mm. the way they're perceived. Mm. So for us to have like debates all the time is, is, is a lot of emotional labor. Because mm. in our daily life, we do that all the time. Yeah. Sometimes even with people we love, if you're in an interracial relationship yeah. or an inter... Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, body relationship, whatever you're going through, it's always hard. Yeah. You know, you, you, you always, um, you're always political. Yeah. You're always in a position of uh, being antagonist because you're not the norm. Yeah. So then to also have a discussion with the people you invite, we just felt that's so not interesting to yeah. us because <laughs> okay. we already fight that battle in life. Yeah. We want to listen and hear and let them speak and mm. have this freedom to um, not okay, let's see what we don't agree with, but what can we bring? Mm -hmm. What can we bring out? Yeah. What can we give the world? Yeah. 
I, I thought one of the episodes that I remember, I, I, I listened to your episodes like, and every time I finish one, I go like, this is my favorite. <laughs> so my oh, just, thank you. Remember, and it always, anyways, but so nice. <laughs> one of the you. episodes that I remembered that I, it was such a difficult because it had to do about sex, sex, sex workers' rights and 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 the perception of that. And yeah. it was with uh, Patricia Kersenhout, and I remembered that I was I was I was burdened by the intensity, hearing things that I felt were wrong. And but it was really interesting how um, I mean, without. I mean, it was clear that you set the goal. Like, I remember it was you specifically who said, okay, but these are the conditions under which I do not want to give a platform to stigmatization of sex workers. I can remember that very clearly that you would say, but. Um, but I thought it was also really interesting for it to be a space that could bring about depth. So there, was a, there was, wasn't was really a debate, but there was a no. bit of a, but there was depth. And I think some of these sort of methods of debate that are antagonistic or positional, they, they lack depth sometimes. They, yeah. It stays at the surface. Yeah, because it's fun or it's entertainment. Mm. And for us, it's a way of life in our day-to-day -day life. Mm. It happens in school. Mm. If you're the only person of color or the only gay person or the only you know woman or only, you know. Yeah. So it's with us all the time. So why, what does it bring to the table? Mm. It doesn't bring depth to the table. Yeah. This will not bring depth. Yeah, because they, they end up staying in cliche arguments. Sort exactly. Of and that, trying uh, to convince yeah. instead of listen and grow together and wow, yeah. you know. Do you have any like sort of, because you've been doing two years now podcast. Yeah. Are there any things that you say like, okay, that really changed. I really learned from that particular podcast or, yeah. you know, any. Poverty. Yeah. I learned a lot about poverty, uh, how um, that's, it's a transgenerational mm. uh, societal burden. Mm. That was very eye-opening. Mm. Um, that being raised in poverty literally has effect on your brain. Mm -hmm. If your mother has gone through poverty and, and stress mm. during pregnancy, it will affect the child mm. and it will affect the relationship. So that was uh, very, um, uh, yeah, that really touched me. And also we had a sex worker, a mm. feminist, feministic, activistic sex worker, who really also I learned from a lot who put me in my place because I'm an old I was up until that podcast I was really an old fashioned feminist mm. and thinking there's no way you can be a happy sex worker. I just that's just not true. Yeah. You're it's always you're always suppressed. Let's yeah. be honest, it's always that you're in a position um, uh, of being uh, used by somebody making money of you or you do it against your will, blah, blah. And I was always like, well, I understand that maybe in, s in certain situations that's what you do yeah. for work because you have no other choice. But I never put in, I never put in, in I never considered free will. Mm. And yeah, manual labor or f a physical labor, yeah, you know, yeah, it's it physical labor, yeah. you know. So yeah, even if there's risks involved, because for me it was always, yeah, but what about the physical risks? Yeah, that's always with manual labor, yeah. you know, there is a physical risk. Yeah, so. Is. And that really opened my eyes because uh, she is a sex worker by choice mm. who comes from um, a happy family, married, n nothing of the cliches that you would expect. Mm. And she is just an independent sex worker who's like, you know, just like you like to have sex at home, uh, you can have sex with someone else, just like you love to eat and cook at home mm. and also can enjoy restaurants. Yeah. That was such an eye opener for me. That yeah. was, wow. Wow, and yes. I like that. I like, um, I like that you, that you, um, that it is a space where you both all can grow as well. Completely. That's really cool. Yeah. Because it, you, you, you people sound so professional. Sometimes you get very giggly, the three of you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <Like> <laughs> but it, generally, it's very high professional sort of level where you... Yeah. Um, and I'm curious, because I've always wondered, how does, the, how does a Dip South podcast episode work? How much time goes in before hanging out with these people and after? Like, I get this sense that it's like... Does somebody have the camera and say the the, the, the audio like okay now we're gonna stop but we're gonna keep talking? Yeah, how it yeah. goes. Okay. Sometimes yeah, sometimes we we we've had really with Flavia, okay. so we had we 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 have went even to dinner later okay. and we just spent almost a whole evening together. Uh, sometimes people are really busy; they have to run away, but they always stay a little bit because yeah. it's so much fun. And, and where are you doing it? I have the sense that it's so cozy. Is it at home at somebody's house? No, it's in Salto. It used to be in Salto, mm -hmm. which is not really a amazingly cozy setting but we make it cozy we make sure we have nice coffee drinks lunch okay. or alcohol or whatever people want you know yeah. we have so that's what i need to do vegan for or yeah <laughs> it's always good to make your guests feel welcome you gave me uh, potato chips i did i didn't give potato chips <laughs> <laughs> that's the olava talks uh, treatment you get potato chips 
So yeah, we always make sure it's 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 comfy and cozy. And um, and now we're uh, doing we get a, we're working with another company. We're working now from the, the Fulmer Park Studios, mm -hmm. uh, which is also nice. But you make your own atmosphere. That yeah. I think that's really important. That you just whatever space you are, you make yeah. it your own. You talked about earlier about um, sort of like as 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 activist women, queer women, women of color out there in the world, you know, dealing with, with, with the world and the debates and the antagonism, even in your personal relationships. Yeah. Um, you had an episode last year, uh, the last one of the season, you had an episode with a number of uh, uh, Zotepit uh, activists, which you're one of, because, you know. <laughs> um, and you had an episode about criminalization, actually, of, of activists. Yeah. In the, of black activists yeah. in the Netherlands. Specifically, yeah. That was an, an incredibly important show. I don't know when you decided to have the show. Was it like right after Dokum that you were like, yeah. you were like, we need to have the show? Yeah, do you mean the, the one with Mitchell and with Mitchell Jesse? And Jesse? Yeah, and we also, Mariam and I also did a, a, a special, yeah. um, a bonus episode where exactly. we spoke about our, yeah. About no, your experiences? That was really important for us. We always knew. Dece come December, we, we have to do something with that. Yeah. There is a high cost for being a black activist, yeah. black uh, anti-racism yeah. activist in the Netherlands. Huge cost. Can we talk a lot about it? Because you also had an experience yeah. today. No, yeah, it's, it's a very high cost um, because um, what happens in the Netherlands now is that institutions will attack, in, will attack individuals. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have the government, like for instance, this, this issue came out that Zwarte Piet Niet, mm. which is a peaceful orga protest organization, may, be, may come on a special list of terror groups. Mm -hmm. That's a major yeah. uh, situation because you have the state fighting against a group of young people who are sort of an organization, but not even officially, mm. who are doing this next to their studies, next to their work, maybe ne like uh, next to their family, mm. to improve something in the world or improve something in the Netherlands for all children. Yeah. Because the only thing we want, if I can speak about it, we, is an inclusive party for all kids. Yeah. So no child has to go through what we have been through, that you're ridiculed or laughed at or dismissed which still has its bearings on society today. Mm -hmm. If you look at the numbers, kids of color get a lower advice for school. And in the Netherlands, as we know, your, 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 your school career is sort of like formed for you from the age of yeah, five. Sure. They start testing you, yeah. and then you end up with a big test when you're 11, and then you, they separate you at 12 years old, mm -hmm. low education, semi-low education, medium education, high education, mm. from the age of 11. Yeah. And it has and lasting, lasting impact on it, your socioeconomic yeah, situation. Completely, because yeah. first of all, you have to study longer, you have yeah. to double uh, classes, mm. and then before you can even go to university, you have to go through sort of like a pre-university mm. studies. I mean, it's, it, it, it literally adds four to five, it can add five to six years yeah. before you are allowed to go into the world and you know, practice your craft and get a job, and then that can be used against you by saying, yeah. "Well, you've well, I see you've you've gone from this education to that education, and it yeah. took you six extra years. I You're know. older now." Yeah. yeah, we spoke about that. So that's really serious. So if seven, like in Amsterdam or in a lot of, I think also in the Hague, in the major cities, seventy-three percent of children of color go to lower education versus mm. seventy. No, sorry, yeah, versus seventy percent of white children going to medium and high education. Mm. I mean, that's a huge difference. Yeah. And and if you have that in a society, and we accept it as a society, can you understand that it's really painful to laugh at kids one day, you know, a, a month out of the year mm. as a joke because of silly Swarte Piet who's like dumb mm. like you and like you're, you know, yeah. oh, but it's not a real person. No, yeah. it's a fantasy figure. But <laughs> yeah. And meanwhile, your my son was called Black Pete in yeah. school. And he was, why, you know, and he has problems in school. You yeah. know, he has HDAD, he works really hard with a tutor. I had, I'm, 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 you know, and I can afford it. I yeah. can send him to a special pedagog, you know, orthopedagog who only works on his insecurity. Oh, wow. Okay. That's what we're working on. Yeah. Because the system does not give him a safe feeling. And there's been research done that if you don't feel safe, yeah. you can't learn. It's very hard to learn if you have to fight cultural um, yeah. um, prejudice from all the grown-ups around you. And you're there from 9, 8.30 in the morning till yeah, 3, yeah. every day. I had, so, um, I had uh, like, during, we're now during the municipal elections, we're having 
a lot of discussions about like in the political parties about like how to deal with this uh, with this under advisement so this this tendency uh, to give that dutch teach, like dutch schools they will give children you know who have the same grades they will give yeah. the kids of color a lower advice in terms of which level they're going to go mm -hmm. they're going to go in terms of uh, uh, and high that's school. what's just to answer your question that's what our whole battle with Swarte Piet comes down to mm -hmm. that having a figure ridicule you mm -hmm. for what and who you are you're born plus after 40 years of colonization and being you know yeah. sold and you know literally being taken advantage of that's what we fight not to 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 ruin a party yeah. but to make the party inclusive to yeah. get the politics and history out of it and to make schools a safer place for and our children yeah. yeah and what happens a group of people who do that next year job next who've been through all this kind of stuff yeah, are being targeted are maybe put on a terror list yeah. and that was put out in the media everybody picked everybody. it up and then later i think they kind of rectified yeah well no probably they're not going to go on the list but yeah the damage is done I'm literally today, as you see, in the papers, are being called a left, almost extremist. Extreme left, yeah. Extreme extremist left because um, Tivoli, uh, Vredeburg in Utrecht, they hosted a party for kids, their first festival. Like you know, last year or something? Last year. Mm -hmm. And the first festival to get kids, it's also kind of very neo economic, huh, to get yeah. children already hooked on festivals every year. Yeah. So we all go uh, to <laughs> learn music. <laughs> and, then, uh, and the parents, <laughs> yeah, and the parents go with and all pay. Uh, yeah. But okay, nice. And what was the theme? Cowboys and Indians. Yeah. I mean, come on, people, that's, that's racist. Yeah. And the only thing I said when people asked me, Oh, why are you hosting something in Tivoli Utrecht? Because you know that at this party, it was like, yeah, we know, we take that very seriously because we're doing this as Dips House. We yeah. contacted them, and they made a statement last year, but they're gonna, you know, wasn't a great statement. But at least yeah. to us, they blah, blah, blah. no, because of me, because I'm a leftist extremist. Tivoli is ruining. I'm ruining another kids' party. And, and, and another one. <laughs> yeah. So the Telegraaf says that. You're just about ruining kids' yeah. parties. That's but what the you do. NOS okay. also picks that up, and yeah. the NOS that's considered neutral. Yeah. So for me to get work or to get my word out, if a neutral party says I'm a leftist extremist, it's harder for me yeah. to be taken seriously if I talk, for instance, to big institutions like the police or in healthcare about racism or about whiteness. Yeah. They're like, ooh, no, we can't invite this woman because she's fact, extremist left. She's connected to a terror yeah, organization. Exactly. If you do, I mean, the, the co international consequences, international consequences of being on terrorist list are like dire. Right? They're yeah. like very, very serious. You know, you can end up not having no flight. Uh, you can end yeah. up or no not visa being allowed to or take yeah. visas in yeah. countries, and you know, it can have very, very serious consequences. You yeah. can actually end up not being able to do invest in businesses, yeah, like or get or bank loan yeah. or something. And the st so, if the state fights against you as an individual, as a small marginalized group, mm -hmm. in already as has been proven by all the numbers, pretty racist society. Yeah. How? Where? How are you gonna? get a job or get another job. And yeah. I said, I'm in a luxury position because I'm older, you know, mm -hmm. I'm 48. I've already established a career. I've saved, you know, I've been, you know, thank God I've been smart and with that kind of sense, and I've been lucky mm -hmm. to be able to do that. But there's people 10 years younger than me, 15 years younger than me, 20 years younger than me, who don't have that background, who yeah. do, how, you know, it's such an unfair fight. And why didn't then take Tifoli to battle? Yeah. No, they take me to battle. I mean, I and, and it, I, think I can handle it, but you know, a group like Swarte Piet needs young people. Yeah. I think it's really interesting this sort of uh, this way that the media and the state come together. Like I was in exactly. Gouda when we did uh, in 2014, 2015. I don't remember. In Gouda we had an anti anti uh, Black Pete protest. And yeah, I was there. Yeah. And um, in 2016. 2016. Yeah. yeah. So, but I was there. We were arrested by the police, and the circumstances under which we were arrested. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I studied law and I'm I studied constitutional law. Like literally, when w how it all happened, I thought like it was the most obvious, flagrant disregard of our constitutional right to demonstrate. I was so convinced of that that when we were like sort of shipped off, it, we were like cordoned off. They, it looked yeah. like they were keeping us safe. That's what they said. They were yeah, like, they because said there were it, all yeah. these neo Nazis all around us. Who were very violent, shouting. We were. We had agreed we were going to be silent, hold our things, and just stand it. That yeah. was all we were going to do. And they would. They cut. All these people came, and they were like, "Yeah, this and n word that, and go to your back to your own country." And they're holding their children. The children are crying because yeah. they're like, "What's going on?" The police surrounds us like this, and we think that's for our protection. 
And we stand there, and we, just, we were like, we're just going to stand there. And put, just slowly moved us out, all of us, into an alley, and then took us all to prison. And locked us in these mobile, in these mobile prisons for like eight hours, yeah. just locked us with two, with two each, and we just sat there. No bathroom, no No bathroom, no. no food. I'm vegan. I was like, I know that I have a right to like, you know. And we're just sitting there, and it was the weirdest thing, and that's also where they attacked Jenny for the second time, yeah. I think. And I saw it happening. It was the weirdest thing where, like, they, this police guy was, was pushing one of the women, and Jenny just tried to sort of protect her. And then four of these MA guys immediately jumped on him, as yeah. if, like, it was like, you don't even talk? You don't even say, oh... Uh, yeah, and the worst thing <laughs> is it comes from the state, because the state then says, oh, they declare yeah. kind of a dec by decree that there could be danger. Yeah. Then, hey, they can do this stuff. So it's all legal. So everything we criticize... Russia for other countries for rightly so. I was gonna get to that. Wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait that's me. what we. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. That's what happens well, in this country as well. Yeah. Well, I thought it was really interesting because when that happened, all these camera, all these medias, yeah. and we could see Adele, we could yeah. see where they're from. They were all around us. Yeah. I thought when we come out, Everybody it's gonna be the scandal mm -hmm. of I mean, they're gonna grill the police. Mm -hmm. We came out and it was like a completely different story. Yeah. I was shocked. I didn't leave the house for a week because I was like, yeah. how could this, how could we all have been there? Not how one. Their cameras have been there. Even the extreme right was not even mentioned. I no. Mean, you could take pictures there of shouting yeah. neo Nazis, like obviously. Yeah. And they weren't even. No. Port and the only thing you saw was, was black people in papers and like, you know, you yeah. they sometimes even use older pictures, you know. But no, we were, it was a silent, that's another thing. Yeah. I saw the pictures. It was a silent yeah. march. But it then they a find another picture. Yeah. We just stood there and I see pictures of us. Uh, and, that's from another protest, yeah. yeah. Who was that? Where were they? <laughs> I should have joined that party. <laughs> and, yeah. and so I walked out of the jail, and it was, it was in the news everywhere. We were the disruptors. We were, you know, we yeah. were uh, uh, dangerous. We had threatened children. Yeah. I saw people saying how we had been calling children, like, racist. I'm like, excuse me, what? Like, yeah. And then the media and the state come together, come and they create a completely fabricated yeah. story. And, yeah. I, and what is interesting to me, especially in the context of the Freedom Books Fair, the Freedom Books Fair is about, um, it started off as an initiative about like a, a writer who was killed, an Indonesian writer who was killed, a Bangladeshi writer who was killed um, because the government didn't want him to speak out. And a lot of the, of the debates and the, and the panels that we're having here are about sort of the freedom of press uh, infringement and freedom of, 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 of speech infringement by dictatorial uh, uh, governments around the world and so on. And I think it's really interesting that the Netherlands portrays itself as yeah. the um, sort of the, 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 the bucker mat. How do you say it in English? The um, Baker mat? No? Baker <laughs> mat. <laughs> New word. I like yeah. it. This is good. Baker, Baker mat. <laughs> Um, as sort of like a safe haven, as the place yeah. where we do respect all these rights, where no, you course. know people don't yeah. end up on weird lists, terrorist lists, because they're saying unpopular things. Where yeah. um, no, where the Bali literally in, invent, invited Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. but they also hosted an evening which sort of like was called "Why Do They Hate Us So Much?" About you know oh the the, the horrors of Islam. I mean the same uh, institution. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's I think Gloria Becker explained this really well. This really this dualistic. Yeah. Self-image and 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 idea of yeah no, we are righteous, so we can use the state to shut down uh, peaceful protests. Yeah. And the media will collaborate in that story. Yeah, because it's part of the Dutch culture to be like, oh, why are you nagging? Everybody's equal here. You know, it's worse in 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 the south in the south of yeah. the United States. Yeah. That that's really part of the Dutch culture because it's not discussed. It's nowhere. It's nowhere. If you not, if you don't look for it, like my, my, my children, they have not. If they don't hear it from me, nobody will tell them that. No. So if you don't hear it at home, really, really religiously, you will. Nobody will explain to you the the, the, the atrocities of the Netherlands, of the, the colonial past, and yeah. everything. Yeah. You know, nobody. So yeah, that's why today we have a group in Uruk who's like, yeah, you know, we're defending our our, our sea heroes. Ridiculous, mm. are taking away our heroes. Because they're not challenged. Yeah, people whom they call them sea. I'm just explaining. That, uh, there's a little city in the Netherlands uh, who has decided to uh, to dec well decorate to celebrate um, uh, 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 like uh, Dutch historic figures such as generals, mostly who were pirates, who were um, who were slave owners or who were slave traders, uh, who enslaved people. Um, 
and 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 who colonized in the west and in the east uh, i mean these people now will be de celebrated by giving all these street names in yeah. work in this little village because they're so tired of people protesting yeah. because this country is amazing and nobody's allowed to protest that's sort of the bottom but line but you have a child in a school yeah. in the netherlands yeah it's it's why hard. do you want them why do you want your essentially dutch child to be confronted with all these unpleasant histories What's, what's, I mean... No, because, I, you know, she, my kids also see what's going on in the world. And I have three children and two are pretty, you know, very light-skinned, are practically white passing. But my son is not. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's, 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 it's horrendous to see the difference mm -hmm. in how they're treated. And, um, yeah, I just don't, I, I, I would get, I'm not going to, like, you know, not do anything about no. that. I think it's extremely unfair for my son, but also I don't want my daughters to grow up like, yeah, well, you know, poo, I'm practically white, so it's not my problem. And thank God they don't, they're, they, they don't, they don't have that kind of character. Mm -hmm. But th that's, it is something you have to explain and, yeah. and, and talk about because it goes for everything. We also had to have the talk about, you know, because still the most slurs that are used are gay slurs, mm -hmm. which is considered completely normal. Mm -hmm. And that's also something I had to really speak to my family. I don't want to hear that word. And yeah. this is why, this is why, no. and this is why. Because, yeah, but everybody says that. Yeah, that's not the point. So you, you for, yeah. you know, it starts at home. But it's sad because my, my oldest daughter is in the third year of the VWO, you know, all perfect school, everything great. But the lessons they learn, sometimes I'm in shock. Mm. They literally had something about slavery. <coughs> And then the uh, the child of a slave owner and a child of a uh, somebody who's made a slave, mm -hmm. their friends, the kids. And then of course the friendship kind of ends because yeah, they're such different positions. And then uh, the, the 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 child of color says, you know what, we can't be friends anymore. And then the white child beat hits him, yeah, because there's no consequence because he's so upset. But then he says, oh sorry. But then the child of color is like, well, <laughs> you've proved my point. Bye bye, you know. Mm -hmm. And then all the kids, the teacher asked the children, so what do you think about the story? And then most of the kids were like, they felt so bad for the white boy because he just wants to be friends. But the, 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 the way the story is constructed already is problematic. Completely. Right? Like, it's, yeah. And then what is the conclusion of the teacher? Because my, my daughter and one of her friends were like, yeah, hello, yeah. Did, did anybody read the story? How can you? And then the kid said, yeah, that's because your mother is such an activist. That's why you think that way. And then the other girl's like, yeah, but I'm white. My mother's not an activist. I also think that way. Yeah, well, we're not talking to you. What does the teacher say? Well, this is a good lesson, you know, in discussion. And, in discussion. Yeah, oh, yeah. In yeah, yeah. debate. And so you see, every story has two sides. Okay, <gasps> next chapter. No. So that's how young intellectual, you know, FAO, are, you know, the yeah. future of our nation yeah. is being taught by a nice left-winged kind of, you know, NRC probably reading teacher. Yeah. And I he think thinks he had a great lesson. He'll probably come home and tell, yeah, we had such a great uh, <laughs> debate in the class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think what I, I also went to school here. And what is really interesting is I, I can still remember the way that, we're taught, that they sort of taught us about en enslavement and slavery and, and the slave trade. It seemed like something so incredibly distant from the Dutch reality. It was something that seemed to be entirely sort of American and and, yeah. and, 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 and Spanish and, and, and French. And what they were doing all that, and English, you know, they were doing all that. And um, and for me, as, as a continental African kid, like living here, it was really strange to, it's been really strange to discover the, like, the, 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 the history of, you know, people from the colonies, from Suriname, who, um, and from the Antilles, to discover that the, 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 the complicity of the Dutch economics, government, and culture into their enslavement and colonization for yeah. so long. It's something I find, like in the last 10 years, I'm discovering, and it just keeps getting worse and worse. Everything I find out, that I find out there were like entire forts owned by Dutch people in the, in the west coast of Africa, yeah. where they were, you know, like sort of, like selling, like selling people, like the worst forts, the yeah. worst forts were yeah. Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> um, I discovered about in the last few years, uh, also because of the work of Simone Zeefuyck and other people who really do make an effort at, at, at decolonizing the museum and, and also talking about the history that we see in our own architecture, in our cities. Yeah. And it's, it is mind boggling to me uh, how much is hidden. Yeah, literally the danger of a single story. Yeah. Whereas, you know, it's not because, yeah, well, we blame, you can't blame me. That's not the point. It's just, it, it 
broadens your perspective to know the whole story, to know all the sides of the yeah. stories, and to also understand historically where it comes from, because that will help you to look at the world today also in a different way. Yeah. I, it, it, and I understand, I, I, you know, we speak about this a lot also in Dipsaus about power structures mm. and how hard I understand it is to give up power. You know, it's hard to give up your cushy position. Yeah. But the thing is, there is enough. Like you said to me why we always, you know, put other people in front or... Because I always realize if I put so, if I put you in front of me, mm. it will only give me something as well. I'll mm. get from you your energy, your love, yeah. and it will help me pursue my other things. There's always enough to share. Yeah. It's and I don't understand why it's so hard for people. Because when you have a child, you know, maybe or you have a pet, you know, you have your favorite cat or a dog or something, and you have another pet or you have another child or another friend. You, it's not that your love is divided. No, yeah, it you know, if you have one great yeah. friend, you get another friend. It's not like oh now I have to share this love with my two friends. No, unless you, it's. Unless it's vegan cake. Okay, maybe <laughs> vegan cake. <laughs> um, I don't share my. And maybe cake. with an amazing lover, you don't want to share. But in general, oh, I share those. That's fine. No okay. vegan cake. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the the thing is, it's it, you get more. So I. I find that interesting because okay, I want to talk about. You said at some point earlier, like okay, I do not bear the same risks as other people because I've saved up money and I have had my career. But what is interesting, what I maybe I'm missing a point, but what is interesting, the things I see you do now are mostly alternative media stuff. Yeah. You're doing, you're part of the, 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 the uh, you wrote this book, you know, um, which like, like literally sets you apart from any sort of famous Dutch sort of level of writing, which is always like, oh, my life as a football person, <laughs> and then my life as a football coach, or like maybe my life as a boxer, yeah. But like you've actually written a political, a you know yeah. book as, and that's rare in the in the Dutch. Uh, what they call BNNers, like famous Dutch people. Um, you do the Dip South. Yeah. You're developing the Dip South exclusives, um, and all these things you're doing to me sound as if you have turned your back to uh, to the institutions. Yeah. And I, not so where is the fight when you say I don't bear the same risk? Is it because you have? You have you're orientated towards alternative platforms is that yeah but it's a luxury i can afford mm -hmm. you know because not everybody can afford that luxury a lot of people just have to ma really day-to-day -day make a living mm -hmm. and i'm in the fortunate situation that financially i'm not independent it's not that i have enough money never have to work mm -hmm. but i can handle it with a little bit you know mm -hmm. it's, it's okay i can handle it but for a lot of people who are building their life or starting a family or looking for that i spoke about to Mariam, who's a lot who's 20 years younger than me that i'm sometimes worried for her because i know she works really hard she has mm -hmm. a regular really important job where she guides you know uh, people who are here who are in the midst of getting their um, documentation and plus she does this activistic work next to it and her media work next to it mm -hmm. how long can you you know balance those two because she works practically she makes 18 hour days easily mm. um that's what it takes mm. to do this alternatively of course it would be great if you have your own talk show and you just get a million a year blah blah blah, blah. but i realized i've tried that i had a that's talk show going with I, <laughs> I had a talk show on yeah. net five when i was in when i was you know in my 30s and I, and I i remember literally standing there in the spotlight with my hair done differently and lost weight for it and in this and literally i can't breathe mm. I, I can't breathe i don't care what kind of contract i have I, I, and i can't just shut up and not say something what i'm seeing or feeling right mm. now so is that when things change yeah, I think that's really when I realized, and it was interesting because it was a, it was a commercial talk show where we had to name all these companies, and and it was also around in the class. And I said, whatever happens, I don't want Black Pete. And it was literally before. It was in two thousand two. You said. Yeah, I said. In two thousand two. Yeah, I said, do it without me, you know, okay. just say that I'm sick, but I'm not gonna sit here okay. on this talk show <laughs> with Black Pete around me. No. It's not gonna happen. And can you imagine 2002? Everybody was like, "Yeah, that's the, yeah." Mm -hmm. What's your what? problem? <laughs> yeah. And I said, "Do it without me. Yeah. I'll just that you know, we'll just invent something that I couldn't be at this show." Yeah. And and then thank God that that there were women, women, you know, open-minded women, produ the producer who spoke to me and listened to me and said, like, "Okay, we'll just have Santa Claus." Like I'm fine with that, patriarchal, but okay. Then we'll just. Okay. So we have only had Sinterklaas. I'm so you proud of it. So that was for me really a turning point, realizing that I'm so much happier doing, you know, opening okay. my big mouth and okay. 
yeah, and I have to find a way to yeah. make a living. Yeah. So sometimes I do really commercial theater, you know. I've done two seasons of a great play about the, the, the menopause, oh, a musical. Cool. And it was really, really nice, worked really, really, really hard. And I put money aside and then I can, you know, focus yeah. on this because I also have kids. But there are consequences. I mean, we've seen, no, totally. with, for example, with, yeah. for example, now that you in the newspapers as extreme left. Yeah, eh? no, my job is, uh, yeah, especially yeah. since this book. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. We saw with Sylvana Simmons. It, I, yeah, that's horrible. Yeah. Hor how she, it's, yeah, it's mind boggling. Belief. It's, I've never seen some, it's, it's disgusting yeah. how everything has been taken away from, stripped away from her. And that's, uh, I will always support her just because of what she's yeah. been through and how she's standing strong and how much she's learned, yeah, how she has developed herself, how she's intellectualized what has happened to her, how she analyzed it, it's amazing, and how mm. warm, and I knew her, because we go way back, we're the mm. same age, when she was, ba -ba -da -ba -da, you know, I was on Net5, she was on TMF, and it was a completely different person, I was different, she was different, it's incredible to, mm. to be closer now than we were then. Yeah. Yeah, she's really my hero, that's how she has stood tall through mm. this no, and everything's been taken away from her. Huh? Yeah. She has no, hardly any work, yeah. like no work. Yeah. And the fact that she took such a risk. And she keeps on going. Eh? She, she doesn't keeps retract, on, she doesn't no. say, okay, excuse me, sorry white sorry, people. Yeah. I was confused. We, we, I think yeah. we had someone, I don't know, yesterday, do this whole like, oh, you know, it's not that bad. And the fleur or something. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. oops, sorry, it's not a, no, but she has gone on. She has, she has even, I wouldn't say like sort of, she has learned into that more intellectualized. Yes. And, and set for even bigger and better and took people with her. And how many people have left her? Yeah. But also people who were supporting her who have said, yeah, it's too much for me. Yeah. And she's like, I, there's nowhere I can, that's what was so- But like, she continues though. She said, I can't go back yeah. because it's true. And that's what we're not learned in society that to fight your battle, mm -hmm. non-violently, of course, of course, um, <laughs> But to <laughs> stand up Extreme against left, it. Eh? Don't go on the terrorist list. No. <laughs> Not on this oh, show. No. Oh God, no. no, no, no. It's really a joke. No, but to 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 stand up for yourself, for your dignity, for the people around you, it will definitely. Yeah. If it doesn't kill you. Yeah. Which happens because we lose people we'll all lose the time. People. Let's not forget that. Yeah. And people literally like this festival. People get killed. Yeah. But what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and also makes you happier. Really. Thank you for saying, I'm really glad you said it because I think... Um, not I excluding think, the risk, huh? Not excluding the risk, but I am, I am grateful for the turn that my life took. I had a burnout. Yeah. I told you in the yes. car, I told you like the way I came into activism was because I just could not... Um, I, like my body, my mind shut down. They were like this whole... This, this trying to meet all these capitalist uh, standards of whiteness, of patriarchy, the hiding my trans, my trans, my, my trans identity for so long, the trying to fit in so hard, mm -hmm. don't ask too many complicated questions. I would read things like Shock Doctrine and like Naomi Klein, I would read them and then I would lock them up in a little part of my brain and be like, okay, and now go to work and, mm -hmm. and help big companies get richer. I was a lawyer for two years. And at some point, my body and my mind said, no, we can't do this anymore. And it, and it came with, with depression and with like, you know, alcohol abuse. And I was, I was, I ran myself to the ground mm -hmm. trying to fit in. And the people that, you know, and I said this yesterday as well, the people that took me out of that were people who were activists, who were women, who were black, who were queer, who said it is unacceptable the things that the system puts our people through. Mm -hmm. And our people, specifically black people, you know, people that showed me that it's okay to embrace your womanhood people that encourage me to embrace it, people that encourage me to work with other people of color and be alternative, accept that some, some certain things are no longer gonna be part of my life. Like, you know, like I, I was taught to accept that these dreams, these capitalist dreams that we have, that they are poison, you know? These people in a period of three years have re-educated me and I stand now much prouder, much stronger, you know, much um, uh, healthier than I've ever been, knowing there is, I've had organizations that I want to work with get calls from the police yeah. saying to them, like, if you work with her, yeah. no, we can't, you know, the police saying to, to an organization, we're not going to work with, what does that mean? Like, the police is not going to come and help if there is a fire or something? Like, Sorry, we're not working with you. Yeah. No, we're just, no, that kind of thing. Absolutely. I've seen that happen, but I can't go back because I've never been healthier. 
Yeah. It and is absolutely worth it. But it is. It is but it just, risky. yeah, and that's why I always say to people, you know, you have to do, it has, th first of all, self-love, self-care, mm -hmm. and you can also practice this on a re tiny, tiny scale. If you're just, you know, nice to everybody around you, mm -hmm. That's uh, that's a very activistic way of living. Yeah. If you're just really kind to the people around yeah. you, because I understand if you have a family, if you're working for the man, and you you know you just yeah. need to make that money, you have to save your children. You're not gonna go everywhere or open up your mouth. I would never blame anybody <laughs> for speaking out in a really cruel work environment mm -hmm. for you know for for your own or somebody else's rights. I understand that, but you can do it on a small scale by being yeah. nice being kind by sharing because literally sharing you literally share also for yourself you get yeah. more yeah, you, yeah. Wow. also for white heterosexual male life would be so much nicer yeah. for them too you know yeah wow this is intense uh <laughs> <laughs> i knew this uh, wait i don't even know what time it is uh, where, where are we doing it we still have a little bit of time so listen <laughs> Sorry, I'm just gonna enjoy every minute that I can of having you. Um, Dip sauce exclusives. Yes. You all let me write one or two times yes. for Dip sauce exclusives. That was really nice. Very gen. But tell me more about Dip sauce. What are you wanting to yes. do with Dip sauce? What is it gonna be? Where is it going? Yes. Well, what and why? Yes, why? Maybe it's the best uh, question to answer first because. Like what we're discussing now, like you said, you, you want, you know, you get wisdom or information mm. or inspiration and you want to share that. That's what we also wanted. We wanted, wow, all these gems, all this knowledge we get from people we hear around us. We want a place for that so people can read it and reread it and look at it and get inspired or, or, mm. or warmed up or whatever. And plus, we also wanted something where people can write longer articles, essays, mm. you know, not just short or columns because there's a lot of great places mm. where you can read interesting, shorter pieces, it's like a nice long read if you okay. want or a very intense personal story without the journalistic rules mm. like this no you what do you want to say what yeah. do you want to share so yeah on our web dips house uh, podcast website we have the exclusives page where we ask or people come to us for interesting articles and it's very intersectional mm. so we have a great article about um, uh, it's, it's a gay uh, Muslim man of color mm. about how it is for him to date and and you know find his way as a, as a, a gay man of color and also uh, you know a Muslim man we have uh, one of the first activistic sex workers yeah. She gave her um, um, view on the Me Too movement. What does the Me Too movement mean for us, for sex workers? Mm -hmm. Which I, is very interesting and she s shares about a lot. Well, you wrote an amazing story, also an article, a reaction on the book of uh, Femke Halsma. It about was, a it was a book. Yeah. Don't call it a book. Okay. <laughs> well, you responded to okay. <laughs> what she wrote in an incredibly, what's your beautiful, eloquent, personal you know, style. Also in Zwart, your story about your father and about being you is, is, is incredible uh, and we want we want people to, <laughs> to read that to find that yeah. to make, take you know if you have the time and you want to so nice can we do a shout out for all the writers out there absolutely who are queer or black sex yes. workers or otherwise whatever yes. tickles your fans whatever is yes. going on all with you beautiful people yeah beautiful people. if you got a story to tell yes please because there are pieces that are, that are missing i mean there's nothing yet on disability for no example, we need Arizona. absolutely i'm uh, what yeah. else did we miss? Uh, wh whatever, stop. <laughs> Write it, yes. send it in, right? Yeah, and we pay. Yeah! <laughs> they, they actually <laughs> paid me! <laughs> I'm so happy. And not a lot, lo because I've worked for the mainstream media, eh? we don't pay so much less than mainstream media. No, you paid really good. So, there's another, know, uh, like, yeah. that has asked me to, and they pay less than you. Yeah, so it's really important for us also that, yeah. that work is that people get paid for work. We don't get paid, <laughs> but everybody who works for us gets paid because yeah. we think that's important because we, we, that's also, we spoke about that, like, yeah, let's share because yeah. we, we have jobs or, you know, we may, we may, we're, I'm, hus I'm a hustler, so <laughs> we have our ways. <laughs> but for people who don't have that, and we want at least that that's not of your worry. That's no. that, you know, that you don't have to worry about, yeah, about at least So I, I identify as a diva because as Beyonce says, a diva is the female version of a hustler. Yes. Okay. But I really do think, because when we started off this podcast, the very first one was with Ashida, Rashida Aziz, and she talks about the need for alternatives. The need for creating our own platforms and, and for really sort of going beyond this, this position of dependency on sort of the white institutions. And yeah. I was very inspired by that. 
the second podcast that we had was about that investment in each other as people of color. When we do turn our back backs on, 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 on these white institutions, then we have the room and the space to actually talk with one another and connect and enrich and be invested in each other. Yeah. She calls it reconstructing. Uh, instead of deconstructing whiteness, let's reconstruct uh, blackness and each other. I think that that's really... But this space that you're creating is exactly that. It is an alternative, yeah. it turns our back, and you're yeah. invested in each other. And Absolutely. You know, it's really brilliant. And for me, it feels like a whole circle come down in these three podcasts. Yeah. It's like perfect. It's yeah. Like... So, yeah, no, that's... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, all, and, 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 you know, like I said, finding that strength in yourself. Mm -hmm. And it can be a little fire, you know, where mm -hmm. you just share a little bit of fire with people around you, like I said, on this, you know, three comes a centimeter. Yeah. That's great. That will give you more life and yeah. more love to yourself. Yeah. Or, wow, I'm ready to, you know, I'm, now I'm at the position that I can say no. Yeah. That you're now you you will not touch my dignity. Ah, that, wow, it's it's and it, it has the same value. And we're not learned, we're not taught, you know. Maybe only white heterosexual men are taught from a young age. Yeah, go for it, yeah. say yeah. it. Yeah. That's eh. and, and if you're not and with astoundingly mediocre results. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. where you're like, yeah. There's no, and I've 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 studied. No, I went to no. I mean, I'll be honest. I went to I went to university in Leiden University, Maastricht, uh, and Maastricht, and I've had to deal with all kinds of variations of white males, and it is astounding that the level of confidence, whether they are excellent or mediocre, is the same. Yeah. You know, and I was working with, I was at, at school with people of color. Uh, and women whom were so ridiculously yeah. good, and you have to be that ridiculously to good get there, to, be, yeah. to be there, and so excellent, but having none of that confidence of the most mediocre man in the class. Yeah. I would sit in class, and you would have people who had studied the book, who had read the footnotes, researched the footnotes, me, <laughs> read the footnotes, compared the, the speak, like, I would be like, can I speak? I don't know if I, and then there would yeah. be someone who didn't even read the book. Yeah, yeah. Who was like, but I feel yeah. Yeah. that this legal system should work like that. And I'm, I'm like, so I would Where? spend most of my wow. time, and, yeah. and, and the, in the way the teachers indulge them as well, Completely. white teachers yeah. would indulge Support and be like, that. okay, so. Um, interesting. interesting? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm like, no, that was not interesting. No. <laughs> yeah. And I worked at some point, I remember I was, I was, I was I'm sorry, I gotta tell this story. Yes, I, yes, it yes, still yes. hurts, no. you know? <laughs> I was um, in my third year of my bachelor. I don't know how much time we have left. We have time. We have time. Okay. So in my, <laughs> in my third year of my bachelor, in my third year of my bachelor doing European law, the European law program was in, in Maastricht, the European law school program was a, what they call bezwaard, like sort of bezwaard, like a, a, an advanced level program. So you mm -hmm. would do all the Dutch law courses, and on top of that, wow. you would do the European law courses. So they would advise us, you know, like, you know, in the, in the, in the brochure, there's like literally a subline going like, you really should only take this course if this, this three brilliant. year program, if you're really sure yeah. that you can handle the pressure. I was like, yeah, whatever. And when I, went to the, when I went to the registrar, this woman, this, this, this white woman who was at the reception actually and was like, are you really sure? Yeah, 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 yeah. Excuse me, I, I know how to read. Fine, I register, I do the course. In my third year, I'm doing the, both of those, 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 uh, those uh, the, the program, doing yes. the program, and I decide to sign up for an international moot court. An international moot court is for law students, like a sort of like mock trial. Oh yeah, you know. So, and it's very elaborate, and yeah. especially if it's international, it's a competition. Oh. You have to. It's like four different rounds, and it's universities from all over the world. You have like Harvard, Columbia, wow. like all these universities participate. And this one was on international trade law. So, the University of Maastricht only allowed master students who were doing the international trade law master to participate in the moot court because the reputation of the university is at stake. Yeah. Right? So, I have a bachelor and I'm like, I want to do this. Yeah. <laughs> because, and I go there and I, and I, I do the, you have this little trial and I didn't tell them that I was only a bachelor. Uh -huh, and right. I go in there and I do my, you have to do a little, you know, pretend speech yeah. and blah. Order and the, in the court. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. that's No, the, not. Yeah, no, no. Your, uh, objection, <laughs> Your Honor. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah, your objection, Your Honor. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So I did my thing and, then, and the teacher was like, I like you, you can join the group. I was like, oh. And then during the, 
as we evolved, they found out that I was actually a bachelor student, and he was like, but you're really good, I want to keep you. Yay. And then, slowly, I also became sort of the captain of the team, right? And I was doing everybody's, I was checking everybody's work, not only in terms of language and com like sort of is it well written, but also is it actually legally correct, you know? So I was doing all this work with a team of three people who were German. I remember a conversation. I remember a conversation where I'm telling this kid, I mean, he was older than me, he was actually, had been a lawyer in Germany at some point in his life, and had come to do a master in, in, in and I'm telling him, this is actually not right, this, you can't write this, this is just wrong, plain wrong, and I'm the captain, I'm like, executive decisions, captain, and he goes like, I mean, I don't even know how to, <laughs> it's difficult, he goes like, you know your people can barely read or write, before, you know your people didn't, you could barely read or write before our people came. And the painful thing is Burundi was colonized by Germans in the beginning. And he says that, and I was like, my victory was that I actually won the whole competition. I got an honorary prize by the, in, the, in Geneva. I won the competition as the best orator. But this is how mediocre these people are. And they can feel absolutely entitled to say like, you know your people didn't know how to read or write before we came to help you. And, and I've seen women of color in university, I know them who are lawyers now, who struggle with their confidence. Mm. You know, so whenever I, like I've met other, like I love your, 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 your confidence about your work and you, yeah. you know, but I've met, I've, with Rashida Aziz, we talk and I yeah. tried to tell her, you do, you've done an amazing book, you've written an amazing book. But there's still this sense yeah. of maybe... No, I, I, got, I have to tell you, I got it from my mother. Yeah. Because I have a Russian socialist mother who um, had very hard childhoods. She had a, you know, she survived the Second World War as a young child, lost her mother during the war, uh, practically lived on her own from 14, yeah. had to really fight to study. So, but at least in the Soviet Union, women are sort of equal. I mean, there's a huge, a lot of violence against women, but on the workforce and yeah. sort of culturally, there's part of an equality and strong women are celebrated, yeah. you know, so to be like a, what we would call here a bitch, there is just a normal woman, <laughs> you know, so I, like I was raised by that. So my mother was always, if you know, I still am so upset. Yeah, about I'm glad, I'm glad because I'm starting to relax yeah, a little bit. I'm yeah. sorry. No, so when I would, if I would come home to my mom as a child, like, yeah, you know, and you said you ugly or brown, my mom would be like, who said that? <laughs> Let's go get them worse than that. Literally. <laughs> yeah. And she would also, you know, and that says protect my boundaries. She'd be like, you don't have to say anything, I will say it, but okay. I want you to see it yeah. so you know that you can fight them. Yeah. Always, you know, yeah. she would literally fight for me and she would see, watch me do what, how I talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> so, and there was also, of course, proximity to whiteness. I had a white mother who was treated horribly because of her accent. She was a scholar. She worked at the University of Amsterdam. It was always treated like she was like the cleaning lady there because mm. of her accent. Plus she was, you know, voluptuous and would wear, wear a dress and high heels and a fur coat. So, so you know, she was treated, but she would always fight for her, her energy. She, and so she t also told me that if you can stand up for yourself, mm. if you can afford to stand up for yourself, it will give you something. It will yeah. not, it, we're t especially for women or people of color or, or gay people or trans people, always thought, you know, you should just blend in yeah. and be nice and yeah. not be too, uh, 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 because, you know, we're already accepting you. So, uh, uh, uh. Yeah. And she was always like, fuck that. <laughs> you ain't, I'm yes. accepting you. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it gives you, because first of all, I said that also in another interview, yeah, my world is smaller now. Mm. It's true, because I had all, more friends and celebrities, but it's so much richer. Yeah. It's so much I don't I would never go back Listen, so if you can afford it yeah, if you can it. and if you have enough you know Netflix subscriptions so you can like chill out <laughs> and that, yeah. yeah I love how Netflix is slowly becoming <laughs> our 21st generation self-care routine for everyone yeah <laughs> it's still they could how do, do you better cope with life, Netflix? They could, yeah <laughs> they could do better they could do better yeah in representation. has anyone seen uh, a black lightning no, it's <gasps> Black Lightning. Black Lightning. Oh no, it's really awesome. I discovered it the other day, like completely randomly. What is it? There's three episodes. It's like a superhero thing oh, series now. But good. It's like Lucas Cage, but it's a different. It's a black. It's also a black guy. Oh. But he has like, and you have to watch. He has like electricity. 
and a family. And it's really cute. It's just amazing. You gotta watch. But they only have three episodes. It's new. Listen, the first and the second ep- uh, uh, podcast, we ended with a, with, a, with a reading. And I would like to do that again. Okay. And, uh, but this is in Dutch. And yeah, I'm sorry uh, 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 for the people who don't speak Dutch. Um, but I would really like you to read... Um, can we do it from here to here? Where? From here. Yeah, the start to, to, here. to here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Can we do that? Yes. Okay. But that would be the wrap up of the. Of the I feel like we need to come back again. <laughs> yeah, I will. Of we course. have so much to discuss. Yes. <laughs> and you're coming and we to also talk, soon. spoke yeah. for like almost an hour and a half. In a car. In the car yeah. <laughs> on the way to here. And we're still. And you'll come there. to Dipsa soon. Eh? Oh, definitely. Yes, Eight, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. 8th of March. Is that a live uh, show? Uh, it's in the theater. Yeah, it's in the Yeah, it's a TV live the show yeah. on the 8th of March, the International Day of Women. Yes. And there is a Deep South podcast live performance, and I am actually on the. Yes. On the stage, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's in Utrecht at Tivoli, Vredemer. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like literally, you get off the train station and you roll out and you're there. <laughs> it's really close, very easy to find. Yes. 8th of March. 8th of March. Okay. 8 o'clock. Yeah. Can you read for us a little yes. bit? And then we're going to say goodbye. Oké. Okay. Um, wit verleden, introductie. Mam, ik moet meer aan cultuur doen, zei mijn oudste dochter tegen me. Ze zit, zat toen dus nog, in de tweede klas van de middelbare school en moet per schooljaar een aantal musea en voorstellingen hebben bezocht. Ik dacht, prima, leuk, gaan we doen. Maar dan ook even weg uit Amsterdam. Even ergens anders naartoe. Het Van Gogh, het Rijksmuseum, het Stedelijk, dat kennen we nu wel. Dus... We gaan naar Den Haag, de stad van vrede en recht en mooie stranden. Een van mijn beste vrienden komt er vandaan en hij vond het leuk om mee te gaan. Lekker een dagje in Den Haag en daarna een ijsje eten op de boulevard in Scheveningen. Hij stelde voor om naar het Mauritshuis te gaan. Dat is namelijk midden in de stad, niet al te groot en alle Hollandse meesters hangen er. De perfecte combinatie voor een dertienjarige. We waren er alle drie ook nog nooit geweest, dus het was voor ons allemaal een leuk avontuur. Ik had er zin in. Uh, Google nou even het Mauritshuis, probeerde ik mijn dochter te enthousiasmeren in de trein, terwijl ze zat te appen met een vriendinnetje. Geïrriteerd ging ze aan de slag. Na vijf minuten was ze helemaal into Johan Maurits van Nassau, Siege aka de Braziliaan. Uh, Mama, hij hoorde dus bij de West-Indische compagnie. Dat is toch foute handel? Boom. Binnen no time googelde mijn vriend, mijn dochter en ik, alle drie de eigenaar van het Mauritshuis. Volgens de site van het Mauritshuis was dit een graaf met een enorm gevoel voor public relations. Een uitmuntende smaak en daarnaast een van de eerste, die heel vindingrijk, Holland bij de transatlantische slavenhandel betrok. Hij introduceerde de driehoekshandel tussen West-Afrika, Brazilië en Nederland. Met dit werk financierde hij de bouw van het Mauritshuis. Punt. Verder geen uitleg, geen analyse, dat was het. We keken elkaar ongemakkelijk aan, terwijl we het station Den Haag Centraal binnenreden. Goed idee, mam, het Mauritshuis. Echt weer eens wat anders, <laughs> zei mijn dochter op haar typische, sarcastische manier. Oké, okay, oké, okay, oké. Okay. Maar als ze op de website al iets uitleggen over de transatlantische slavernij, zullen ze daar ook wel aandacht aan besteden in het museum, zei mijn Haagse vriend. Hm, ja, maar op de website hebben ze het wel over slaven en niet tot slaaf gemaakte, mam. En ik wil wel eens weten waarom, die omschrijving, waarom ze die omschrijving hebben gekozen, concludeerde mijn woke dochter. Terwijl we entree betaalden in ontvangstzaal, stonden we naast een statig standbeeld van graaf Maurits hemzelf. We waren benieuwd naar de rest van het huis. We liepen een trap op en waren meteen onder de indruk van het prachtige pand. Warme houten vloeren, zaal na zaal vol met meesterwerken van schilders zoals Rembrandt en Vermeer. En ondertussen keken we rond naar Hins over de handelaar. Mijn dochter had in de trein al braaf allerlei vragen opgeschreven. Hoeveel mensen zaten op zo'n schip van Maurits? Zaten er ook kinderen op de schepen? Waarom is die Maurits een held, terwijl hij Nederland als eerste heeft betrokken bij de transatlantische slavenhandel? En is het waar dat het Mauritshuis met dat geld gebouwd is? Mm-hmm. We liepen zaal in, zaal uit, geen hint over tot slaafgemaakte mensen. Op een gegeven moment vonden we in een van de zalen een hoek met twee schilderijen over Brazilië. Misschien staat hier iets, zei mijn vriend. We stonden met z'n drieën voor een schilderij van Albert Eckhout. Dat was een van de schilders die in opdracht van Maurits naar Brazilië was gereisd. En het schilderij heet Studie van twee Braziliaanse schildpadden. Bij de beschrijving van het schilderij wordt vermeld hoe fijn het was dat de mensen thuis in Nederland werden blootgesteld aan allerlei exotische verschijnselen. Zoals deze schildpadden en allerlei andere spannende dingen zoals ananassen. We keken om ons heen. Nergens in het museum werd iets vermeld of besproken over de rol van de eigenaar in het kolonialisme of de handel in de tot slaaf gemaakte mensen. 
Alleen op de website van het museum, in een YouTube-filmpje, is te horen hoe het zesjarige bestuur van Maurits van Nassau-Sichem een bijzondere periode was voor Brazilië. Want hij liet onderzoek doen en zette kunstenaars aan het werk. Hij bouwde paleizen en creëerde een tolerante samenleving. He? Oh, wacht even. Hij haalde tot slaafgemaakte mensen naar Brazilië en hij liet Hollandse schilders exotische dingen schilderen voor de mensen thuis en hij is een held. Maar waarom wordt dan niet het hele verhaal verteld? Zeker in een museum, een nationaal kenniscentrum. Dit is niet een glossy tijdschrift, het is geen entertainment. Je zou toch hopen dat juist een dergelijk instituut zoals een museum 400 jaar koloniaal geweld enigszins onder ogen komt. De missie van het Mauritshuis is het beste van de Nederlandse schilderkunst in de Gouden Eeuw tentoonstellen. Blijkbaar is er voor de invulling van de educatie van de museumbezoekers gekozen voor de abstracte driehoek van handel in plaats van voor mensen. Blijkbaar is de luxe genomen om tot slaafgemaakte mensen onder de noemer handel te plaatsen. Maar waarom? Waarom hebben we het over een abstracte driehoek van handel? Mijn dochter wil meer weten over de mensen op de schepen. Wat waren dat voor mensen en, en hoe heten ze? En bestaan daar verhalen over, schilderijen, dagboeken, net als bij Anne Frank. Waarom zijn ze niet belangrijk genoeg voor het museum? Dank je wel. Top, we're done. Bye. Thank you so much. Sinds geweldig.